As part of our continuing look back at 10 seasons of the agenda, tonight we take you behind the scenes of one of the more tense moments in Canadian political history. Nearly 34 years ago, three Canadian politicians gathered in a kitchen at a government building in Ottawa. Against all odds, they kicked around some ideas that turned into the makings of the 1982 Constitution Act. Those three politicians, Jean Chrétien, Roy McMurtry and Roy Romano joined us for a conversation back in April of 2012, 30 years after Queen Elizabeth signed the agreement. Pay close attention to what Jean Chrétien has to say about his definition of Canadian values. Seems as relevant today as it did back then. The Three Amigos of the Constitution, that's tonight on the agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. And joining us now for the full hour tonight, Jean Chrétien, 30 years ago, he was Canada's Minister of Justice. He went on to become Canada's 20th Prime Minister. Roy McMurtry, 30 years ago, he was Attorney General of Ontario. He went on to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ontario. And Roy Romano, 30 years ago, he was Saskatchewan's Attorney General. He went on to become the 12th Premier of Saskatchewan. It is great to have you three amigos of the Constitution here in our studio tonight. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. I want to start by setting the stage and taking you back. 30 years plus five months, November 1981, representatives from the federal government and the 10 provinces are meeting in Ottawa to try to figure out a repatriation of our Constitution. Negotiations are going nowhere. You three meet in a kitchenette, a pantry, in the Government Conference Centre. And here is former CBC News reporter, now Senator, Mike Duffy with the details. Roll tape. History has been made in some pretty unusual places, but there are a few historic sites to match this rather ordinary looking kitchen on the fifth floor of the National Conference Center. We are told that it is in this room that the seeds of the compromise that was reached today were planted. Here. This afternoon, clearly Romeo jubilant, and McMurtry, and Romano and Chrétien came back to the kitchen where they met yesterday. That's your that's, that's the one I gave you, but the one that I had was right here. <laughs> <laughs> but these feds, you know, you got to have the right one in the hip pocket. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yesterday, we, uh, while there was discussion and there was movement, uh, you know, we, we had another meeting here. Yesterday morning first. Yesterday morning first, and uh, yesterday afternoon, and... Uh, so at that time we said we might be three, and after that it was four, and after that it was five, and by uh, one or two o'clock in the morning it was six. <laughs> Monsieur Chrétien, what were the circumstances that got you three guys in that kitchen on that night? Because we had been debating, you know, a way to solve the problem of patriation of the Constitution, and at the same time the Prime Minister wanted Trudeau wanted to have a new Charter of Rights and Freedom for Canada. And it was a debate that they were willing to agree to patriation and a Charter of Rights, but we have to pay a price for that. It was what we call a people's package, but they wanted to have all sort of rights, delegation of powers or control of powers by the federal government. And there was no end to the discussion. Eight provinces had formed a group that we called the Gang of Eight. Including Roy Romano. And Romano was there. <laughs> and with Trudeau, there was a Gang of Two, uh, Davis and Atfield, and of course, uh, McMurtry was is there. <laughs> and of course, we were going nowhere. You know, we had chat, the three of us in the morning, and uh, if there's any solution <clears throat> to the crisis, and, uh, and by the afternoon, we're going nowhere. And Trudeau was to adjourn the meeting. No, to say that's over. And I said, gave us uh, another try. And he adjourned to the meeting, the meeting to the morning. So I 
asked Romano, and we met in the kitchen, and after that, they could not find McMurtry. Eventually, McMurtry came and joined us. <laughs> and basically, it was not a very complex deal. It was not tons of pages. It was problem of, you know, we wanted to patriot the Constitution and have a charter of rights. The difficulties were the amending formula. We had an amending formula that was uh, agreed in Victoria that gave a veto to Quebec. But the group of hate had persuaded Lévesque to drop the veto on Quebec, to have a nominating formula that called for 50% of the population representing seven provinces. It was not what Trudeau wanted, but we accepted the Premier of Quebec had accepted it. And uh, we some thought that the Charter of Rights was to give absolute powers to the court. And some of us, and on that I did not agree with Mr. Trudeau, I felt somewhat that in the democracy, the people elected should have a way to overrule the abuses of judges, if that could happen. They have these crises regularly in the United States, and uh, now we, that became the notwithstanding clause. Okay, stop there for a second, because <laughs> I, I want you to pick up the story from there. You were, you meaning province of Ontario, Premier William Davis and your team, were on side with Mr. Trudeau's package from the beginning. Just two of you, you in New Brunswick. Yes. How come from the beginning you were prepared <laughs> to sign on? Well, I think Bill Davis realized that uh, this 50-year debate had gone on long enough and we had to move and that's why we agreed to, uh, to support the unilateral approach of the federal government. Uh, without the support of the provinces, except for Ontario and, and New Brunswick. But it should be pointed out that there have been, while interesting things happened in the kitchen that night, uh, Prime Minister Gretchen and Premier Romano and I had been meeting together with other ministers beginning in the summer of 1980. And, and we had spent a lot of time together. This wasn't something that just came together so you overnight. you knew each other well. Mm -hmm. We knew each other well. We'd been to the Cambridge Law Conference together in debated, July. Debated, and debated it. it uh, in July of 1981 while we were waiting for the decision of the Supreme Court. We met in uh, Mr. Cretchen's home after the decision. And, and so we had a lot of dialogue between us. Uh, as we, uh, as, as we advance towards the, uh, the drama of the Kitchen Accord. Mr. Romano, you were part of the so-called Gang of Eight. How come you were offside from the Prime Minister's package from the beginning? Well, basically we had two problems in Saskatchewan. The, the fundamental one was the Supreme Court decision, which in effect, as we interpreted it, took away the right constitutionally for a province to deal with its natural resources. It did so on the argument that the resource, in this case it was potash, crossed interprovincial boundaries and international boundaries and thereby fell under federal jurisdiction, Section 91.2. So this Supreme Court decision was, in effect, a constitutional amendment. Big problem for you guys in Saskatchewan. Big problem for Saskatchewan and for Alberta. Blakeney also had, Premier Blakeney also had, some reservations about an entrenched charter of rights and freedoms. Uh, the Ontario idea of floating the notwithstanding clause was the potential bridge here. I want to say two things very quickly though, Steve. I want to pick up on what Roy McMurtry says. This is a product of, if I may say so, Prime Minister, rather immodestly, uh, us knowing the file. We weren't the only ones who knew the file. All of the ministers from the other governments with their advisors knew the file. And after a while you got to know and trust each other, but because Monsieur Kretzian and myself were co-chairs. He used to call us the, the, the Tuke and the Yuke show, <laughs> was the way they described it somewhere. In the summer of 1980, after the referendum. That's right, summer of 1980. Tuke, you, we you, we you were meeting every week, uh, yeah. many times, and he was a chair for representing the provinces. I was on the other side, and we were on TV all the time, and they called it the Yuke <laughs> and the Tuke show. Yeah, well, tuke, yeah, that's right. So that, I so was the Tuke. You know, you're, you're, you must have been the Yuke. background, so you're yeah, the I, I was okay. the Yuke, obviously. <laughs> okay. But the point is we knew the file, and we knew each other, and we knew where the possible trade-offs were, which is what McMurtry is pointing out. The second point that I want to pick up on the Prime Minister's uh, observation is uh, that afternoon with the meeting up in the fourth floor, came to an abrupt halt, was when Mr. Levesque said, 
that he had to go back to Quebec City because his assembly was being called. I quite don't know what the reason was for that, but he wanted to obviously bring it to an end. Mr. Trudeau said, well, if we can't get an agreement, we will have a national referendum, which stunned everybody. This is my recollection, Prime Minister. Yeah. I'll finish off on this. Yeah. The meeting was adjourned. Everybody milled around. The Prime Minister is the Prime Minister for a reason. He took initiative, came to me amongst others, and said, look, we've got to find a little room because of the crisis here. Hmm. And uh, I shouldn't say this, but I remember at one point, it may not have been in the pantry, but the Prime Minister said, you know, I went through one referendum in Quebec where families were divided down the middle. I can't imagine such a debate in Canada. One referendum too many. We have got to find a solution. And and we're so talking about Prime Minister Gretchen and not Prime Minister Trudeau. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 no, mean, you know, the was problem just is, yes. what yeah, happened is, is that we were at deadlock. No. Mm -hmm. And when Trudeau, and I remember debating that with Bill Davis and Trudeau at one time before, you know, we were not keen of having a referendum, mm -hmm. but Trudeau said we have, you know, more or less it became a tactical approach. He didn't know what was to happen if there was to be a referendum. And, and right away, Levesque jumped on it. And every other premiers and ministers of the other province were stunned. It was a mistake, wasn't it? Mm. By yes, him. because how can Romano go in Saskatchewan and Blakeney and Lougheed, his first bill in Alberta had been a Charter of Rights, <laughs> to go and fight against a Charter of Rights? You know, none of the premier of attorney general of the other provinces, they would have had to campaign against us having a national charter so, of right inscribing the constitution. So why did Levesque go for that? Because he felt he could win a referendum again. He wanted to have the revenge. He had lost yeah, the referendum. Uh, I, I, and he felt uh, that if there was to be a referendum, he could have a chance to defeat Trudeau hmm. in arguing that the charter of rights and freedoms were taking powers away from the provincial Quebec government. Yeah. Quebec. Mr. And, and I just very briefly would say, I totally agree with what uh, Monsieur Chrétien, <laughs> uh, now before Prime Minister Chrétien, uh, undoubtedly he thought he could win. But I think also he was beginning to sense that the unity of the Gang of Eight was dissipating very quickly. <laughs> but I would argue, there's one other interesting dimension to history. I think it is well recognized, and the Prime Minister Chrétien here can dispute me, that the Justice Department officials never had drafted any national referendum legislation. In fact, Mary Dawson, who was Associate Justice Minister, has written in an article that she was instructed mid-afternoon that afternoon to start working on the referendum. It was a serious, it was a bluff, but it was a serious bluff. No, but when our, uh, Monsieur Levesque said yes to a referendum, he had to envisage having a national referendum, and he's right. We had no legislation hmm. for referendum. Mr. McMurtry, I want to ask, if, if you just got plunked into this story and you didn't know any better, you would think it difficult that somebody from Quebec and Saskatchewan and Ontario, a liberal, a new Democrat, and a conservative, would have had that much in common and gotten along so well, given your basic differences. How is it that you three all got along as well as you did? Well, we spent a lot of time together, uh, particularly... Well, going to the <coughs> baseball game, for example, yeah, you did. in Montreal. Oh, yeah. uh, we spent a lot of time together <laughs> starting in the early summer of 1980. And it's not just the three different parties, the three different regions, but three different cultural and linguistic traditions of Canada. I mean, to, but the interesting thing is, Steve, we never talked about that. I mean, we just took for granted that as three friends, as three amigos, that we could get along. And political partisanship just never reared its head. Now, I, speaking very frankly, I don't think it could happen today because the country has become so divided uh, politically and, uh, and quite frankly with a prime minister who believes in, in sort of division and wage issues. And I don't think we, we'd ever see that happen today. And I think it was an important and very special Canadian accomplishment. You know, uh, you know Roy mm -hmm. was working with Bill Davis, who played a mm -hmm. very important role in all that. Because Bill Davis was a, fundamentally a moderate person. Yeah. 
and he, you, he, you know him, you know, he kind of a jolly good fellow type of person and never very harsh on anything. And he was, you know, and he was trapped in, in that debate. So he was, you know, he played a, a big role because, you know, after we were in the kitchen, you know, I said, you two guys, you go and sell it to the province. I have a bigger problem. I have to sell it to Trudeau. You remember? <laughs> I remember, yeah. Yeah. And I went and uh, arrived at Trudeau's home at 9 o'clock. We, we had journey around 6 o'clock. So I went yeah. to have a, a little meal in Trudeau. And remember, Gold Denver drove me to 24 Sussex. Right. 9, he dropped me there. I was going nowhere. Because the deal, Mr. Trudeau, you know, was strongly opposed to the notwithstanding clause. He wanted on, that charter left alone. Yes, he was of the notion that, you know, the court are to protect the rights, absolutely. I was of the other view, that the override was, in my judgment, giving the people, you know, the last word. The legislatures. Yes, mm -hmm. but in a difficult way. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the notwithstanding clause, you have to understand, you have to write down notwithstanding the equality of this and that, I want to discriminate. It's better for you to have a good argument. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, after five years, you have to reintroduce it. So I felt comfortable with that. But Mr. Trudeau was not. And I said to him, Prime, you know, I called him Pierre when I was alone. Pierre, you can tell me to go head down on the wall, I'll do it. <laughs> but I know the wall would not break, it will be me. We're there. You know what we and, and when Davis told him, you know, it's better for you to accept this compromise that uh, uh, Romano McMurtry and Chrétien had advised, you know, uh, I will not stick with you. And now Trudeau came back after that phone call and Hang questions. On, this is what I want to pick up on. All right. Because in this studio, almost three years ago, we had Bill Davis yeah. talking about that night when you were at 24 Sussex. And when Mr. Trudeau left the room to take a phone call, you didn't know who the phone call was from. No. Mr. Davis picks up the story. Roll tape, please. Some months ago, Mr. McMurtry had a very lovely dinner at his place. Uh, the gentleman you just heard from was there. I always said to Romano, if he'd been born in Ontario, he would have been a progressive conservative. Uh, Jean Chrétien was there. I said, gentlemen, I may be writing a book. If I do, you three people will have to understand, in spite of all you have said, all you've said about yourselves that have written, will go totally down the drain, you'll understand. You were really just carrying papers for the first minutes. I mean, I had some fun <laughs> with them. Kretchen said to me that night, we heard there was a phone call. In fact, he checked with the prime minister. There was a phone call. He said, I don't know who made that phone call. I looked him straight in the eye, and I said, John, you really don't know who made the phone call. Light went on, and then he realized. You really didn't know it was him no, who called? No, I didn't called. know. Mr. Trudeau was, you know, he was like that. He did not say that somebody had to call him. Because Davis made that call, and then I know, but Trudeau you know, I am mind. there with the ministers. Mm -hmm. And the debate is, we don't have a deal, let's go alone to London. And I didn't, and you know, by that time it was evident that we were not to have a referendum, and so on. And, uh, you know, so... Trudeau, the minister, of course, if you have the minister of justice, Chrétien, who is in disagreement with Trudeau, and there is a bunch of other ministers around, yeah, I, I was alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but after yeah. he got that phone call and from after Davis, he, got that phone call, he came to you and said what? No, no, he came back, and when he had very strong opposition, suddenly he started to ask me questions that made sense. <laughs> Meaning he agreed with you. He started to agree with me. Did you know but, he was making the phone call, Mr. Yes. Davis? You did know he was calling the prime minister essentially to, he wouldn't put it this way, but essentially to issue him an ultimatum. Either you compromise or I withdraw Ontario's support. Is that what happened? Well, I believe that that's what happened. But Bill Davis, again, as you know him well, is a very understated person. And he's not likely to say, I threatened this or I threatened that. But what he said to me, something to the effect, well, I just wanted to know, let the prime minister know that, that we thought that the not, <coughs> notwithstanding <coughs> clause was a good idea. Words to that effect. Apparently had an impact. <coughs> and and after that, when the time, <coughs> so it was 10 o'clock, when he had the phone call, he came back, 
could see the question was a different nature. <laughs> so we walk out and he grabbed me by my arm and he moved me into another room. And he didn't say anything. He said, Jean, if you can have seven provinces representing 50% of the population, I think I might accept it. And knowing him, I felt pretty good. <laughs> and, that, uh, and I went. It was 11 o'clock, and I went home. During that time, these guys had gone to the provinces to discuss among them, can we go this way? And they were, and they were not knowing at that time, because I could not reach Romano, that I thought I had moved Trudeau. So they were working in a kind of vacuum, but I asked them how they were working it out. Okay. I was not there. You, I had a tougher job <laughs> was to convince Trudeau. Well, he had a pretty tough job, I think, convincing Blakeney and, uh, and uh, the Premier of Alberta, Peter Lougheed, well, who would actually, have been asleep that night, right? Well, uh, Premier Lougheed has this habit of getting, and it's a wonderful habit, he looks terrific. He goes to bed around 10 o'clock in the morning, and did in the morning, in the at evening, night. Yeah. at night, sorry. And uh, he uh, had done so. But he had uh, fully dele delegated much of his authority to Peter Mikkelsen, who was a senior advisor. We all knew Peter Mikkelsen is a very honorable person. So in Blakeney's suite, working from the kitchen, so-called Accord, and Mr. Kretchen and I had agreed to be in contact, but I was basically flitting around. I was doing honest work, actually, that night, the Prime Minister. I was flitting around <laughs> in the Ontario uh, suite and otherwise. Blakeney was working with the officials most of the other premiers were staying in the fourth floor of the Chateau Laurier. Only Davis was at the special hotel, and Lougheed was at the Skyline Hotel, and Levesque was over or as we, in, 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 in Ottawa, in Quebec, in Hull. So <clears throat> our job was, at that stage in the game, to work with our colleagues, minister colleagues, and Blakeney's and the other premier's job was to try to convince them all into this approach. One of the big difficulties, which is a big worry, is that I was to tell Jean Chrétien where we were at, and I couldn't do it. In fact, the joke that he makes often was he kept on phoning me until 6 o'clock in the morning, and he wanted to know what I really was up to that night. <laughs> we have to remember, this is, this is before cell phones. This is before texting and, and emails yeah, and all right. of this stuff. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. You guys are working hard lines all night you know, long. Yeah. I arrive home at 11 o'clock, <laughs> and Aline says to me, Gardy Gardum has called three times. You know, Gary Gardham was the British Columbia. British Columbia representative, Minister of Federal Provincial Relations, something like that. And he's a colorful guy. So he called me. So I called him. I said, you, he said, I want to know if what uh, Romano and McMurtry are telling me is true. Is it true that you guys, you know, that Trudeau might accept it? By that time, I said, yes. I'm pretty sure now he's sleeping on it, but I'm pretty sure he will say yes tomorrow. And that, uh, so he said, you, my bloody Christian, you have your new constitution. <laughs> you know, use a kind of colorful word, perhaps even worse than the one I've used. And he said, uh, we're there. Saskatchewan is there. Yeah. Ontario is there. The four maritime provinces are there. So that represented seven provinces and more than 50% of the Canadian population. And the Supreme Court test was met. And, yes. And Mr. and I, he said, <coughs> Lloyd is not there, Manitoba is not there, and Quebec is not there. So for me, I was there. So I was trying to have either of these two guys to confirm that, and I was calling Romano <laughs> at the shadow, but there was no answer. Well, here's the question. Did you try to get a hold of Levesque? No, because, you know, I, I never dealt directly with Levesque. Did anybody try to get a hold of Levesque? I don't know. You know, it's not for me. I, I think well, it's, <coughs> it's right. It's not you for know, you. It would have been for them. Well, I think, I had my I job was to deal with Trudeau. You dealt with yeah. Trudeau? Well, I, I, can, I, I believe that Premier Lougheed was in touch with Trudeau in the morning. Not I mean Levesque. Yeah, was, Levesque. Levesque, I'm sorry. Yeah. Not Trudeau. Levesque, I keep on uh, confusing. But Levesque was contacted by Lougheed, I believe, in the morning when it was too late. You see, the, the Gang of Eight had a rule. The rule was that no member of the gang could leave until they gave the other members of the gang a notice to leave and on what basis they were going to leave. What, coming back to the fateful afternoon that uh, Prime Minister Kretchen has described, what shocked the gang of eight was when Levesque 
adopted the challenge of a national referendum thrown out by Prime Minister Trudeau. He was breaking from Trudeau the took the line that says, if we can't agree, then the people of Canada are going to decide. Would you agree? He accepted. We were shocked. Now, to be quite honest with you, looking back at it 30 years later, I think we were relieved, certainly from Saskatchewan's delegation, that we were finally free of the Gang of Eight, which took place. But I think Levesque was advised that morning too late. Who was his equivalent of you guys? Morin, Morin, Claude Morin. 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 He had also Chardon, Claude Chardon with yeah. him, but Morin was a, a, the chief advisor. There's also another little incident uh, related to the Gang of Eight, and that was that Sterling Lyon was not there. Yeah. He went home he to Manitoba. He had to go back to Manitoba. Yeah, he was in Marshall. a very tough and, and campaign. It is. And I and called his, I happen to know his campaign manager very well, and very early in the morning, uh, uh, six early for me, I phoned Nate Nergitz, who was campaign manager, and I said, and I think it was about that time, I said, Nate, the gang of eight have now been reduced to the gang of two, Quebec and Manitoba. And I said, I don't pretend to be an expert on Manitoba politics, but I don't think it's, you would really like to go into this tough election as a member of the gang of yeah. two. And Nate said, I I understand entirely. He found that persuasive. He no. found that persuasive. Yeah, but <laughs> the reality is this, is when we met to sign, Mercier was the Attorney General for Manitoba, and he was trapped with everybody else uh, signing. So he said, and he signed, uh, the document expressing the view that he had no authority to yeah. sign. A caveat was attached. With a caveat that this is subject to the approval by the Premier and the Assembly of Manitoba. Lyons was fundamentally opposed to a Charter of Rights for a very, he, he was opposed to the notion of a Charter of Rights because he felt that it was a, an American concept and that he was very British, you know, he was very much common law person. He was a, a very good lawyer, yes. very common law. And, the, you know, the, the uh, Magna Carta was good enough for him sometime, I think. The president <laughs> that succeeded. And he didn't want to sign it. Yeah. And he did not sign it. And it's only the week after that the new premier won on the election on the Monday, the NDP uh, premier. Uh, Polly? Polly, Polly Howard Paul here. Yeah. Confirm the week after yeah. that now you can count of Manitoba uh, on that. And in the days that <laughs> succeeded the deal, we made some amendment to the proposition. Yeah. Two you, for sure. Uh, one on women, two for sure. One on women's rights, clarifying that, and one on First Nations rights. Yes. And, uh, you know, so it, the deal was not closed. Okay, but I know it wasn't your, you were the federal guy, so right. it wasn't your responsibility to go and yeah. Wake up René Levesque in the middle of the night and say, are you okay with this? I understand I that. I didn't have a, even wake up Trudeau. I waited until he woke up. Okay, I understand <laughs> that. But did you, as a Quebecer, as a fellow Quebecer, have any issue with the fact that Quebec was not signing on? But for me, I was not representing Quebec. I was representing all Canadians. And I knew that the Quebec of government have their own jurisdiction and their own responsibilities, and they should do their own work. I was doing my homework, and they had to do their homework. If they, you know, it's <laughs> not for me to, uh, the problem, you have to know too. <clears throat> and I said that. You read the book, the memoir of Claude Murray, and he write in that that our goal was to block the initiative of Trudeau. Yeah. He confirmed that in the book that I read not long ago, uh, that was a few days on your program that Ron Graham referred to. He had interviewed Murray. Shot on the other minister, who was a nice person, you know, an easygoing guy. And I had said in Vancouver, you know, I can have a deal. I know Trudeau wants a deal. Be reasonable, I will get you a very good deal. You know what he said to me? Christian, forget about it. We're separatists. Mm -hmm. The article number one of our program is the separation of Quebec from Canada. Let me do ask you, you think, about that. Do you think <laughs> that we can be the father of the new confederation? So well, I, we were, I had that in mind. Was I mean, I think Ontario traditionally felt that we had a very special relationship with the government of Quebec. And it was very difficult, the concept of isolating Quebec. 
But, I, but the background to that, in my recollection, is that Barassa had agreed to Victoria Agreement in 71, had, had split off, or had uh, changed his mind a few days later. Yeah. And, and then I had spent, uh, had dinner one night in summer, way back in the summer of 76, with the Quebec Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and he said, thank you very much for trying to sort of uh, accommodate Quebec, but we don't want an agreement mm -hmm. with the federal government. We're about to have an election, which they did have in the fall of 76, and, and we soon would be able to bash the federal government with the lack of a constitutional agreement as one of our political strategies. So uh, Bill Davis and I realized that, quite frankly, even if Burasov, Barassa was still there, that uh, he probably would never agree, find it a reason not to agree. So he said, if we're going to have to break with Quebec, which really was very painful, it's better to do it with a separatist government than a, an allegedly federalist government. Was it your sense as the process went along that there was nothing under any circumstance that René Lévesque would be prepared to sign because he was a sovereignist? Absolutely. I must say that there were many moments and many meetings that I had with Morin where I was kind of hopeful. But uh, what gave it away for me was when they, in Quebec, they gave away in Winnipeg, I think it was, at one of our meetings of the Gang of Eight, as the Prime Minister Chrétien points out, gave up the veto for Quebec, something which Trudeau said he regretted, he should never have done. I thought this was really uh, a surrender which uh, was a desperate surrender designed to keep the gang of eight together at all costs in order to prevent a settlement. So uh, having spent a lot of time with Morin and, and his advisors, I, I was absolutely convinced no deal was possible. So you know, you all three know, that this night has gone down in Quebec history as the night of the Long Knives, the night of Quebec's humiliation, the night when Quebec was isolated and forgotten about by all the rest of Canada. How accurate is that portrayal in your view? You know, for me, you know, it was an agreement. There will never be enough for them. They didn't want to sign. And they could not sign. Because suppose that Levesque signed a new Canadian constitution. Can he get up the morning after and he says, I don't want to stay in this country anymore, despite of the fact that I am responsible for the new constitution that meets the demands of Quebec? And what was Article 1 in the PQ platform? That was the Article 1 of the program. It was, Separation. It's what the, uh, the minister had told me in Vancouver, Claude Chardon. And I knew that. I had all sort of discussions with them. You know, uh, uh, in the corridors, and uh, you know, we, we talk to each other. We're civilized people, and and you're on my view. If you're a separatist, and you have some dignity, and you believe in it, you do everything to not have a deal with Canada, so that you know we, you will go eventually. So, Steve, I think there's another <clears throat> important dimension to it, which uh, Jean Chrétien would recall very well, and that was that the people. In Quebec's, uh, in the Quebec government caucus and the National Assembly, they were not the only representatives of Quebec, and this is where it's all been distorted. There were 74 federal Liberal members, was, all elected by the people of Quebec, all of whom supported. Well, but patriotation, I thought. 74 out of 75. No, I no, think. 72. 72 out of 75. One, uh, Jean Robert, uh, no, Jean Robert Gauthier. I remember. Warren Allman did not vote for that okay, because yes. we were not going far enough, another one. We had 72 out of 75. Plus, when there was a vote of disapproval in the Quebec Assembly, about 25 or 20-25% voted against the motion of the PQ that was supported by Claude Ryan. Hmm. Plus, when there was polls in Quebec, at that time, are you in favor of patriation of the Constitution? Do you want to stop to be a legal colony of Great Britain? 92% of the people will say yes. Mm -hmm. Only a small crowd in Westmont probably said no. <laughs> and, and, you know, the same thing on the Bill of Rights. And today, I, I heard you a couple of days ago, yeah, there was a poll where still the Quebecers, more than 80% of them, 
are in favor thing. It was a good thing to have this charter of rights and freedom, and they think that patriation of the Constitution was a good thing. Again, and can I make one additional comment, which is small, given the, the weighty contributions of my colleagues here. But put yourself in the position where on that fateful evening morning, it was conceivable, I don't think so, that we would walk away as Canadian leaders not having made a deal and the impact that would have had domestically and internationally I think would have been catastrophic. Particularly if you'd walked away from a deal, the only opponent of which... Uh, of which Quebec was, absolutely. was a separatist. A separatist, uh, absolutely. So I, I think there was a, a number of principled reason, reasons for the agreement, but a very practical reason, too. Uh, I mean, th this is really would have been a lot of uh, It, it is very sad. You know, I, I wish that they would have signed. But it's not unusual. You know, the Bavaria, Bavier, never signed the German constitution. And they're still part of Germany. In Quebec, they, say they did not sign the constitution, but they use it. But you, more than anybody else at this table, and maybe more than anybody in this country, have paid a heavy price for the lack of a Quebec signature. They have called you some very terrible things over the years. Yeah, but when you play hockey, you expect to go in the bump in the ramp once in a while, but you do the same thing. Do I survive it? When I, you know, I don't want to talk about myself, but when I quit as Prime Minister of Canada, 65% approval rate I had in Quebec. Of course, a big element of it must have been my no to George Bush on the war in Iraq. The last election I had, and that caused the departure of Bouchard, I had 45%, my party had 45% of the votes in Quebec, and the bloc at 40. Not bad for a guy who was to be... It's not bad, but also I, I would add this. I mean, it's hard to, for perhaps some of your viewers to believe this, but in political life, there are moments when you have to act on principle. And if uh, Prime Minister Chrétien and Prime Minister Trudeau and a whole bunch of the others were part of the so-called Night of the Long Knives and paid a huge price, particularly Chrétien, that's short term in the longer span of history and as it evolves, not only the polling, this is what counts. And uh, does anybody today, I mean, there may be some people obviously in Quebec have reservations, does anybody today in Canada seriously think, well, maybe some do, as you alluded to in an earlier comment, but I won't get any further, that a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that a patriated constitution? No, I hear you, but, but when you went back to Saskatchewan, they didn't call you Von Du. And they didn't call you that yeah, either. But, you know, oh, no, no. You but got that. When no, you got, you know, but, you you got know, sellout you, when you no, went to I will tell you, look, read the history of Quebec. Read my first book. You know. Uh, straight from the heart? Straight no, from the no, heart. The straight, first chapter. No, no, straight I, through the heart. You know, that was <laughs> coming later. You know, you know, my grandfather had been refused Holy Communion because he was a liberal at Easter. Imagine, my grandmother had all my uncles and my father on their knees every night to recite the rosary so that Grandpapa Francois would not go to hell. And, uh, you know, and it, eventually the, the church and him, he was a liberal organizer in that part of, of Quebec, and, you know, the bishop had refused to give him the absolution because... Uh, it was a liberal. So, you know, it's worse than to be called a vice. <laughs> it is. And I just want to add one small P.S. It's a small P.S. But we did pay a price in Saskatchewan. We almost got wiped out. Only eight members of the Blakeney government were re-elected within two weeks of Patriation Day, April 17th. A lot of it was the fact that we were spending so much time down there dealing with Quebec and Ottawa and Chrétien and Trudeau and McMurtry and Davis and all that. Why weren't you attending the business? So you pay these prices. I think we're looking at this thing 30 years later. Question is, was it the right thing to do under all the circumstances? Would it have been better to have Quebec? Of course. Possible? Not possible. Well, we could, we, you know, I know one guy who thought it was a pretty good idea at the end of the day, and his name was Pierre Trudeau. And we have some tape of him. Uh -huh. Here's him talking about you in the House of Commons in November 1981. Roll tape, please. I would first like to thank most members of my caucus, and particularly the Minister of Justice and the ministers of this government who have stood steady in the endeavor to achieve 
these three objectives, Madam Speaker, and I think the applause that we have just heard is a, a just expression of uh, our happiness with this outcome, having, after 54 years of failure, having succeeded in creating a consensus to give Canada its constitution with an amending formula, but into the bargain to put in a charter of rights, particularly in the area of language rights. You had a front row seat for that comment. How was that day? Well, I mean, when your boss is happy with you, you're happy. <laughs> that is, you know, it was, a, 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 you know, I, he <coughs> asked me to do the, this job and it was very exciting because I spent years discussing that. You have to understand my background. I was not prepared for that in a way. You know, I'm a small town guy and there's no lawyers in Shawinigan who, has, here it comes uh, who has a client who wants to raise the end on any case in court, the constitutionality of the court and whatever. So to be trapped in this debate, discussing with these guys, you know, because the prop, you know what is a charter? The charter is you take away powers from the federal government and the provincial governments and you give it to the people. So the, these guys were very protectors of their powers. You know, they had some funny incident. I remember one day, you know me, my style, we're there and there's freedom of speech. Are you any objection? Of course, these guys, oh no. Freedom of association, no. Freedom of religion, no. So suddenly, freedom of conscience. So one of these guys said, Mr. Christian, what is the freedom of conscience? You know, I'm not a professor of philosophy. <laughs> and I was trapped. I said, yeah, it's difficult to explain. If, is it absolutely needed? I'm not sure. And you, our, your friend, Pierre Genet, who was a lawyer for me, I was sitting there and he gave me a kick under my chair. <laughs> when I said the spy of Trudeau doesn't want me to concede that, you know. <laughs> you know, it was a type of discussion, very stimulating. I will go in front of the committee of the House of Commons. People will come and discuss the right of the handicap, the, the rights of the woman, the rights of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the natives, uh, you know, the right of the people with different style of living, the gays' right, and so on. You know, it, you have to understand that 30 years ago, gay marriage was not part of the agenda mm -hmm. of any of us. But, but there is a legitimate debate. I mean, it, it's done, but it's a legitimate debate. You know why because, we got that, eh? Well, pardon me? We have gay marriage in Canada because of this guy right here. Oh, yes, it is. Imagine. Yeah. The, the last week the I am prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm leaving. I feel good. You know, I've been there more than 10 years. And, and suddenly come a judgment from the appeal court of Ontario that declare that it is unconstitutional not to have gay marriage. That was the last gift I needed before leaving. <laughs> and I had to deal with it and so on. And we decided that you know, we were not to intervene and the judgment will stand. And it's the law of the land today. Mr. But, but Steve, just make one point, I think, which is a little bit off topic, but I want to make it. Um, I think there still is uh, an ongoing discussion of some importance. The issue here really is uh, whether or not elected representatives in their determination and the balancing of rights get it correctly. Obviously, very often, as our history shows, they don't. Versus... Uh, the Prime Minister, Chrétien, refers it as the people, it's true, but essentially the interpreters will be the appointed judges. Uh, I think, suspect this debate will continue to unfold. I hope, I believe, I trust that it won't unfold like it has in the United States, where the court has become extremely politicized and the issues become extremely politicized and then appointments become partisan yeah, and the like. Right. We see it all the time. I think we're going to avoid that here because of a different culture and different society. Different. And there, thereby, I think this is a great day, not because I was a small player in it. It's a great day for Canada, for the Prime Minister, Trudeau, all of the people, because we've defined the basic values of this country. We've talked about some Even very, with the challenges. Sure. We've talked about some very weighty things at this table tonight, but I want to put something that's a little frivolous on the table, if I can, for a second. When he was signing the Constitution on behalf of the government of Canada, he swore. Do you know what he said? Yeah. What did he say? Mert. Which means? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> the first letter, you know. Mr. Kretschmer, no. <clears throat> you said, oh, Now, shit. what happened? It's not a very complex thing. I, had, you know, I signed on the document. 
In fact, the theory under the, the protocol I was not supposed to sign. But Mr. Trudeau had put my name right under the Queen. So she signed, but normally it was the Registrar General yeah. and the Secretary of State who would sign the Prime Minister. The Minister of Justice, Attorney General, was not signing on these documents. Had I been doing some work on that for Trudeau, he put, you know, great twin to have my name on the Constitution. And he put my name right under the Queen. She signed. He signed. I moved to sign, and I pick up the pen. And Mr. Trudeau had broken the tip of the pen in signing. <laughs> so it is. I know it's the new Constitution of Canada. And the pen is not working. So I said something. What did you say? And the Queen, you look at the picture, and the Queen looked like that and looked like that to see if anybody had understood. And, and uh, she laughed. So the press have asked me for years, what did I say? <laughs> And I would say to the press, it's a state secret. <laughs> and eventually, I revealed that I said mer. And the queen is bilingual, as you know, so she understood very well. So she, she had a big laugh. Uh, but you weren't the only one saying mer. Because just at that time, as you were doing it, a beautiful cloud storm burst took place. Ah. And the rest of us who didn't have the awning were wet. And we were saying <laughs> mer as well. I, I saw you there. Yeah. You got rained on. We were all wet. I want to, we, we've got a few minutes left here, and I want to play a bit of a what-if game with all of you. Oh, that's a waste of time. No, I don't think, well, because Ron Graham plays this game in his book, and I know you like this book. I love this book. What if, what if he had gone ahead without any provincial support at all, maybe just the original two? What if he'd gone to England and he said, I know I don't have a consensus of the provinces, but I want you to pass this constitution anyway, and that way, Quebec would not have been isolated. In hindsight, might that have been a better way to go? Well, it, it, they couldn't have gone that way because the British government would never have agreed. You don't think so? No, because the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court of Canada had ruled the government, there was a convention. And while this is argued by scholars, the convention is a political issue, not a legal issue. The fact that the Supreme Court of Canada had ruled that there was a convention that required substantial provincial consent would have made it impossible, in my view, to, uh, to get the agreement of the, uh, the federal government. And if it hadn't happened uh, the way it did, I rather believe, uh, expect that we, our constitution might well still be an act of the British Parliament. Yeah. Uh, I think that's absolutely true because, and this comes back to Premier Davis, if you have two supporters and one from the largest province makes a phone call at 10, 11 o'clock, as has been described here, saying, I'm off it now. If two is insufficient, one for sure would be insufficient. But I would say one thing, which is a little bit of sidebar, you're probably running out of time. When we did lobbying before this whole arrangement was set up with a lot of lobbying on the Gang of Eight in London with individual MPs, I tried to get a hold of, as chair of the, the, the Gang of Aden, co-chair of the whole CCMC, there's a conflict of interest here, but that's another issue. And I got a meeting with Sir Nicholas Ridley, who was the Foreign Commonwealth Affairs Secretary, nine o'clock in the morning. And this is before the whole deal was arranged. And Ridley came in, nice pleasantries were exchanged. First thing he said to me, Mr. Romano, what in the world are you doing here? Go home. <laughs> and those are exact words. We'll do what Prime Minister Trudeau asks us to do. Go home. Now, I couldn't get to see Ridley, so I have you on television now. Is it correct that the federal government gave Ridley and the UK government permission to communicate that message to us so that we can no, communicate you know, it? Probably look at the situation. I've been there, you know, after we had to go, and Quebec and others kept lobbying a lot to block. I have to tell you, it was very unpleasant. I remember one morning on a Friday, I always remember, we had lunch. It was a bunch of lords. And here was the Minister of Justice of Canada. It was pretty late past the damn legislation. You know, we're waiting for that. And they were taking time. And, oh yes, but we'll pass it, sir. Hey, if you do this with the Indians, if you do that with the French, if you do that, I got unhappy to use a proper word. I was not very happy. I said, okay, guys, we'll adjourn. 
tomorrow I'm going to Northern Ireland. <laughs> and on Monday I will be back with you. And in Canada we don't have any problems with, between the Catholics and the Protestants. So I will tell you what to do to solve the problem in Northern Ireland. <laughs> so let us solve our own problem and solve your own problem. So it was the situation. You know, here I am representing a country that is the G7. And having some Lord and some MPs from England telling me what to do in Canada. Well, do you think if Pierre, if Pierre Trudeau had gone to Margaret Thatcher and said, I don't care if I only have two provinces, you have to pass this, she would have said no? If she had said no, there was another alternative. Which was? We had to proclaim the independence of Canada unilaterally. Ah, okay. And you were prepared to do that? I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't speculate. You know, I'm happy I didn't have to do anything like that. We convinced the Brits like yeah. we convinced the provinces to have a deal. And unfortunately, it's unfortunate, but on the program of the PQ was they cannot make a deal about Canada because they wanted to be out so of Canada. So would it have been better? I, admittedly, it's what if. W would it have been better to go over to Britain with only two provinces and say pass it, no. and that way Quebec would not have no. been isolated? No, no, no. no. They no. would have found another argument. No, you know, no. the notion of separation is you have to be completely unhappy with Canada. Steve. You, so, and it's because you're completely unhappy in Canada, with Canada, you, you want to go. Steve, mm -hmm. 10 seconds. Let's assume they had done this and the answer was no, which I think would have been the answer based on what Roy says on the Supreme Court and Prime Minister Chrétien's comments. Where would that have left Canada? When you talk about weighing Quebec's, I mean, this is an important issue. We continue to try to resolve that situation. But can you imagine the country after could all have, of this turmoil? It could have broke up the country completely. Absolutely. So there's no choice here. A correct decision made. Let me then in my last two minutes, I, I've tried to keep this conversation out of current politics, but what the hell, let's play here. The government of Canada has barely done any official recognition of this anniversary. What do you think of that? But I, you know, the prime minister issued today, I'm happy because last week I said something, I was asked a question and I said, you know, confederation was done by Johnny McDonald and I celebrated it and he was a Tory. So now this morning he said that the charter and the constitution was too controversial with some Canadian that he does not want to celebrate that. You know, but this is 60th anniversary now of Her Majesty as the Queen of Canada. It's not everybody who is in favor of the monarchy. My minister, John Manley, is opposed to the monarchy. You know, and uh, you're, but we're celebrating the Queen anyway. She served uh, the Commonwealth in Canada well for 60 years. Should I s not celebrate that, and you too, because John Manley does not like uh, uh, the monarchy? What do you think, Mr. McMurtry? <clears throat> well, I... Uh, I mean, I think the current prime minister just simply doesn't want to give any credit to Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Kretchen for the work they did and for the accomplishments of all of us who were involved. And, and he sees this charter of rights, in my view, as a basically a liberal <coughs> document, a liberal initiative. And, and that's why he probably brought in the Diefenbaker Bill of Rights, which was well-intentioned, but had no real clout because it was just another act of Parliament and was not entrenched in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. My own view is that it was somewhat mean-spirited. And, uh, and I regret that, but uh, that's politics in Canada today. What do you say? Well, I say, first of all, um, he is out of step with history, not only past, but the future history. There is a generation, uh, I'm fortunate to be doing a little bit of teaching at university, 30 years now of the bright young minds who are imbued with all of the glory and the challenges and the freedoms of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Prime Minister, Mr. Harper, is out of step. And secondly, he's out of step on an international scene. This model of a charter, there are a number of charters that are around, is viewed internationally with a great deal of respect because it tries to avoid the pitfalls of the Americans. So if you look at the long haul, whatever his intentions are, he's out of step and he'll pay a political price for it. That represents the values of Canada, the tolerance of Canada, 
the understanding among ourselves. You know, we incorporated the need for uh, equalization payments to help the poor parts of Canada. We have enshrined the right of the natives in our society. We have enshrined, you know, uh, the, 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 the equality for the handicap, for the woman, for the man, no problem with religion. Multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. These are the values of Canada. Yeah. And, you know, I hear in Alberta there was a statement made by a candidate of the Wild Rose, you know, that uh, is pretty excessive. And I'm very happy that, uh, you know, we have the Charter of Rights, you know. Uh, that is awful what some have said on a society that have some gaze into the society. Let me thank all three of you for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your 30th anniversary of the Kitchen Accord with us here. Happy anniversary to you all. And let me say on your behalf and your behalf, Happy 80th birthday to you next month. Oh, no. Roy McMurtry. He's no. going to be 80 next no, month. No, no, no. Well, he doesn't look it. <laughs> no, 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 no. He doesn't look it. He and doesn't, and he does <laughs> not act it. <laughs> you know, when I met the Queen in May last year, she received Aline and I with others of the Order of Merit. And she told me, uh, Prime Minister, imagine I will be 85 next week. Hmm. I said, Your Majesty, there is nothing there. I have a brother in Montreal who is 94, and he's putting money aside for his old age. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Jean Chrétien, Roy McMurtry, Roy Romano, thank you to the three amigos of the Constitution. And that is the agenda for Friday, November 20th, 2015. Monday on the program, the 24th Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, whose new book comes out this weekend. Incidentally, will be here for a feature interview and an intimate look back at his time in office. And we hope you can join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again on Monday. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.